Thanks, it's really a pleasure to be here and really thank you very much, Michael, for the invitation. Um, so I am gonna be speaking about this book project, which is available uh, on Amazon if you're interested in purchasing. Um, actually, so this, I'm speaking about this work that um, that, um, that I did as a, largely as a, as a dissertation at Cornell, as a PhD student. And one of the things that um, interested me in when I first started studying the Mars Exploration Rover mission was the role of images on the mission team. I was captivated by these incredible pictures that would come out and be on the front pages of the New York Times or displayed across some website somewhere and wondering what role were these images playing in the kind of work that scientists were doing? How did they make them? What, what, where did these images come from and therefore how could we understand where they went? So when I was initially working with a team, I started off as an ethnographer and I was on my second day of field work when I heard somebody in the team said, well, you know, when you work with the team for a while, you kind of learn to see like a rover. And as someone who was interested in visualization, I was fascinated. I was like, what could that possibly mean? So over the course of the next you know, 40 minutes or so, I'm going to describe uh, ways of seeing like a rover that bring together a couple of these really important questions for human-computer interaction and for computer-supported cooperative work. First of all, how do people do science with data visualizations, and how do they do science with, with robots? How do organizations matter to science and technology uh, and to user experience? And thirdly, what makes for a kind of technology that people love? And I'm sure for many of us who do design work that that latter one is, is really an important point. To do that, I'm going to draw on ethnographic work. I'm not sure uh, who you've heard from in this series so far this year, but ethnography is a well-accepted technique in anthropology and sociology and now also in human-computer interaction. Anthropology uh, was, was the field that started doing ethnography, and what happened was people would go off into the field, and they would, they would you know, go to some remote island, and they would be like, what are the natives doing? And they would write about what the natives were doing, and then they would come home and publish a book, and that would be that. Uh, we've come a long way since then for a variety of reasons, uh, but one of, the, one of the elements of ethnography that's still the same is I basically did that with scientists. Like I went away, spent a bunch of time with scientists, what are the scientists doing, and then came back and was able to write about that. Ethnography uh, relies on a series of different techniques and practices, including interviews, including participation to some extent in the practices of the mission. I worked as an image calibrator. I interviewed something like 80 different members of the team from uh, the undergrads working on summer projects all the way up to the people people who were running the mission and people who worked at NASA. Um, it meant visiting, in this case, uh, 10 different sites that were affiliated with the mission because this is a remotely operated vehicle. Obviously, nobody is on Mars, but also nobody is entirely at NASA. These are scientists and engineers who are spread out across a variety of different institutions around the United States. So getting to visit those different areas. And I sat with scientists at their desks while they manipulated images and tried to see new things and do science with the pictures that came back on Mars. And I sat in on almost 500 different meetings of scientists scientists and engineers sitting together and trying to decide what it was the robot should do the next day on that other planet. So this, was the, this is the kind of data that I am working with and will be speaking about today. I should also tell you a bit about the robot that I'm going to talk about today, or the robots that I'm talking about, because there have been a lot of missions to Mars relatively recently and a lot of public imagination about Mars. And how many of you have seen The Martian so far? Yeah, OK, excellent. So there's lots of different uh, ways in which Mars has captured our imagination. The robots I'm going to talk about today were launched in 2003. They arrived on Mars in 2004. There are two of them. They both were identical at the time of launch. One was named Spirit, and the other is named Opportunity. Spirit, unfortunately, passed away in 2011. Um, if any of you would like to hear about the robot funeral, uh, I'm happy to answer questions about that in Q&A. <laughs> including what you wear to a robot funeral, because uh, as an ethnographer, that was a, that was a challenging question. Um, and Opportunity is still exploring today. It's been 11 years. It's still working on Mars. So there's a couple of things that these robots can do and a couple of things that they can't do. And this is really important to preface the talk. The robots were designed as robotic geologists because they're looking for evidence of past water on Mars. And geologists have a pretty good way of figuring out how to do that. They're equipped with a variety of different cameras, nine in all. Um, Two that are mounted at the top of the uh, at the very top of the mass. The two large ones are the panoramic cameras. These are the ones that have color capabilities, and they tend to produce the really beautiful spreads of color images that you see in the newspapers. There's also cameras for navigation that can provide a sort of wide-angle view. There's specific cameras mounted um, under the solar panels in the front and in the back of the robot that uh, have a kind of fisheye lens. They take in a much broader view so that they can uh, detect whether there's hazards in the, in the way of the robot so the robot can drive around it. Um, and there's a little hand lens one uh, as a microscope. The robots also have many different uh, spectrometers on them. Uh, so they're taking spectral readings of the rocks around them. And they have this little piece of equipment out here that will allow them to scrape the, the coating off a rock and see what's underneath. So those are the kinds of things that the robots can do. But there's a lot that they can't do. 
um, they're not incredibly bright. <laughs> they, have, they have some artificial intelligence, but it's incredibly limited. What this means is if they are driving along and there's a rock in front of them, they know that they should not drive over that rock. But of course, a huge problem on the mission was if they, if they then know that they should drive around the rock, are they going to end up going in the same direction, or are they going to drive around the rock and sort of end up over here? So that was one of the main artificial intelligence tasks that people were working on at the time of the ro uh, that the rovers were in operation. So they, they can't actually do a whole lot. The other thing that they can't really do is they, sorry, yes? So is there like no human operator controlling the thing that would just start to you know, like drive around the rock? Or they this is what I'm going to get to next. So the robots, uh, because of the, the, the distance between Earth and Mars, there is no single operator with their fingers on a joystick, with their hands on a joystick. There is no uh, individual operator who's responsible for what's happening on Mars. And because it takes 7 to 20 light minutes for a signal to get there, you can't actually do anything in real time. So instead what happens is a whole community of scientists and engineers who are responsible for not only thinking about what the robot should do scientifically, but also what it can do practically in terms of engineering concerns, um, have to meet on a daily basis and decide exactly what that robot's going to do the next day. And they get together and they come up with a detailed plan that then gets uploaded to the robot at one go. So when the robot wakes up on Mars, it gets its instructions from Earth, it goes and does those things, and then before it goes to sleep, it sends the data back, and the people on Earth wake up, they get that data, and then they try to figure out what it should do next. So that's what a planning cycle looks like. So the robot is not making decisions autonomously. It's not working autonomously. It has very, very limited artificial intelligence, very limited autonom uh, uh, autonomous capabilities. How long is the day? Sorry? How long is the day? How long is the day? A Martian day is... Mars day. A Mars day is 24 and a half hours. So it's very close. Yeah, very close. But so when they first initially worked on the mission, they worked uh, together at JPL and they worked on Mars time. So that means that you start your meeting at 9 o'clock in the morning and it's 9 o'clock on Earth. And of course, the next day it's 9.36 on Earth. And before you know, you're meeting at 2 in the morning or you're getting off shift at like 6.30 in the morning on a Sunday trying to get a beer in Pasadena. Uh, which is, turns out it's hard to do. Um, they don't tend to work on the Martian clock anymore. They have ways of sort of working out the time difference between the two places. But they're very much aware of what time it is on Mars and versus what time it is on Earth where the robots are. Also, the robots are on opposite sides of the planet. So they aren't working together. They are very far, far apart. So what, when you communicate with one, you should, typically you can't necessarily communicate with the other. So that's a little bit about what they can and can't do. So uh, I'm going to come back to this notion of seeing like a rover and describe three elements that I observed on the team that are part and parcel of learning to see like this robot. First of all is a series of digital visualizations and digital manipulations of images that allow you to see like the robot does and not only do science but also make decisions about where the robot can and can't go. Secondly, I'm going to describe a series of embodied uh, relationships that people have with these robots, the kinds of physical uh, instantiations of the robot that they take on in their own body. And this is the part that gets really, really fun. And then the third element is the part that I argue you need to have as a, as a base to understand why, these, why they're behaving the way that they are, and that is the question of social organization. So I'm going to bring these three things together to unpack what it is to see like a rover. Let me start with data visualizations. So uh, seeing like a rover, first of all, means learning to uh, have an appreciation for the native views that the robot sends back from Mars. So the images here are taken by the uh, hazard avoidance cameras. These are the ones that are perched under, just looking over the wheels, under the solar panels, and they enable you to identify if there's any hazards in the terrain. And they have this fisheye lens because they're trying to take in a much broader you know, expanse so they can actually do something with that. Um, they can actually do something with the data that they acquire. So, uh, and, and this is really funny because when, this image, when images like this first came down. It's often some of the first ones to come down from Mars. Apparently there was a reporter in the room at the time and he was like, oh my gosh, Mars is really different. It's super curvy. <laughs> And uh, they were like, no, it's not actually super curvy. It's the lens, right, that's doing that. But interestingly, it would be super easy to correct this in an image processor. I mean, you just press like a single button and you could turn it into something that looks more like a, a, a rectangular frame that we are used to looking at with human eyes. But they almost never do. Almost never. When these images are presented, instead scientists will talk about the kinds of ways that they had to learn to see these images. Um, one of them described using an image on, the, on your right, which is the one that was taken before the robot flew, saying, I need pictures like this on the right to make the correction. I sort of get a sense in my own body of what it is like to see this way. And another scientist, whenever he puts these pictures up in a presentation, he's like, just remember, objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. So this is a way of, first of all, demonstrating that you have a members-oriented way of understanding Mars. That is, you're a member of the team. You start to become a member of the team when you can start to see Mars this way in the way that the rover does. 
But it's not only about being able to see natively like the robot, it's also a question of being able to do the kind of data visualizations and manipulations that are going to allow you to see into wavelengths that the robot can see that you can't. So here's an example of some turfed up soil at an area where spirit had gotten stuck. Um, and uh, the scientists were analyzing the, 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 the images of the soil because it turned out that there was this white soil that was like underneath the Martian, the, the red stuff on top on the Martian terrain. And they were trying to understand where, where it came from and what it was. It turned out this became one of the most important uh, discoveries of the mission that the area had once been an ancient hot spring, much like Yellowstone. But when I talked to scientists about these sorts of images of, of Mars that are all, you know, red and so on, he was like, look, we know Mars is red. Like that, we just know, we get it. Seeing more natural Mars colors doesn't help. I'm not going to learn anything. When I'm learning something, that's when I'm seeing Mars in false color. Now I'm learning something new. So the way that you create these false color images is not to sort of meticulously paint them in by hand. Instead, what you do is you take pictures that are taken through the robot's different filters in front of the camera lens, and you, you combine those filters in ways that don't correspond with the sensibility of the human eye. So you put them through a red, green, and blue uh, sort of color set in order, to, uh, in order to produce this color, but it doesn't relate to the human eye. And in fact, that is seen as being much more valuable, because that way you're harnessing the way that the robot can see, and not necessarily the way that people can see. And just as a, a sort of side note here, I should note that these kinds of visualizations occurred across the mission over and over again. And there was never a sense that there was one best way to see Mars. There were only lots and lots of ways of working with these images and seeing different elements of the terrain at different times. And as a scientist put it, when you see Mars in all these different ways, then you get to know it. So it was never a question of what's the best picture, although obviously when you start sending things out for public release, you think very carefully about what it is you're presenting. But instead, many of these images circulated behind the scenes in a variety of different forms also presented in terms of graphs and so on. And it was never a question of an epistemological certainty of like this, you know, the graph is a better way to say it and see it and not the image. Okay. But it's, so you don't always want to see Mars in color. Sometimes you want to see it in 3D. Um, particularly you want to see it in 3D if you're interested in driving the robot because you'd like to know if there's anything that might trip your robot up. So the scientists would take, uh, and engineers would take pictures that the robot had taken from the right eye and the left eye and put them together into what it would be a 3D anaglyph. And this was long before the days when you could like go see the Martian in 3D. But people would have these 3D glasses that they would wear around the lab. And they described it how that when you take a look at it in 3D, different things pop out at you, right? You can see that the terrain pops out of you. It's kind of undulating. I could kind of see there was a ridge here before, but now in 3D, I can evaluate this better as an obstacle. So there's a couple of things that are important here. One is not only that you're able to see things in 3D, but secondly, that you're able to evaluate things as obstacles. And obstacles are not obstacles for people, and they're not scientific targets. They're obstacles for the robot. Here's another example. This is a, a composite uh, image that is taken using hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images were put together to make this one picture. What you're looking at at the base is a, a picture taken from orbit top down of the ed edge of a crater. You can see the rover is that little gray dot at the top. This was taken by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter um, overhead. What was happening was opportunity, they wanted to drive opportunity down into a crater and be able to drive opportunity back out of the crater again, which is uh, an imperative, right? You want to get your robot in and out. And in order to do that, they needed to figure out what the slope was at different areas in the crater to figure out what the right way was to get in. So they drove the robot around over several months to different areas or promontories in the crater and took tons and tons and tons of pictures, loaded that all into some software that graduate students were busy writing and tweaking, and eventually came out with a kind of topography of the terrain that was used by comparing images from different locations, kind of like a big parallax problem, right? But so here's what's fascinating. They created this contour map. And the contour map is the kind of thing that you would think geologists would get very interested in, particularly around craters. But in this case, it was not a contour map about the actual value of things at the craters, it was really about where it was safe to drive or where it was not safe to drive. So this is kind of the rover's eye view of what that crater would be like. It certainly does represent scientific values, but the values that are really important are the degrees of slope that are going to trip up the robot. So here's where we start to move into from these visualizations that try to take on the rover's point of view and the rover's body to starting to have stories and narratives and gestures that connect your experience on Earth to the robot's experience on Mars. As one of the engineers put it, one of the important things to know is about how the rover sees the world while it's driving. This is really important. Um, so what the rover's view of the world when it's driving is like your view of the world. If you imagine yourself trying to make your way through a dark, cluttered room with nothing but a flash bulb. So what you do is you kind of take a picture and then you close your eyes and you go along a little further and then you take a picture and then you go through your eyes. And so that's the way that the robot sees the world when it's driving. 
Um, this is obviously important for the rover driver to have a good sense of what it is that robot is doing. But notice how what he does is link the robot's visual practices and the kinds of pictures that he's going to receive on Earth to then the kinds of things that the robot is going to do on Mars. Um, but people had a variety of different uh, stories that really connected the robot's experiences to human experiences. And this is where things get really interesting and exciting. Um, people would talk about the robot having a sense of touch, that when it used its rock abrasion tool and was, was feeling out the rock, and that you could read the kind of graph that resulted about the kind of pressure that it was using on the rock as a way of understanding the way the robot was touching the rock. So they would get that sensibility in their body. Your eyes sort of become the navigation camera or the panoramic camera. And some people just said simply, you know, when I'm working with these robots, I am a rover. Um, I should note that this is very different than anthropomorphism, right? Although anthropomorphism does happen on this mission. So anthropomorphism is when we project human characteristics out onto the machines that we're working with. And in this case, anthropomorphism was very visible in the fact that the rovers had very different personalities. So opportunity is the glamour girl. Opportunity just goes to Mars to find water and she falls in a hole and opens her eyes and bam, there's evidence of water. She's the white collar rover. She never had to work a hard day in her life. She was born with a silver spoon in her mouth. That's what opportunity is like. Whereas spirit is a little more hard working. She's more hard nosed. This is the blue collar rover. This is the little rover that could. She gets to Mars and there's no, there's no evidence of water anywhere and she has to drive really, really far to get there. She's not the kind of robot who's going to go 300 million miles and then give up. Right? Instead, she's the kind of robot that's going to persevere. So these are the sorts of stories that are told about these robots and we're part of animating their personalities behind the scenes. But it's not simply that we project human characteristics out onto those robots. Really the kind of work that I'm talking about here is the kind of work where people would take robotic characteristics also and bring those back onto themselves on Earth. So I started to see this in a variety of different forms that, yeah, go ahead. So were those uh, kind of projected characteristics of the two rovers um, almost preordained by the missions, or was it really by all of these glitchy things that happened to Spirit along the way that just kept happening at the time that person <laughs> got developed, or was it yeah. kind of from the start because of a different mission that they always... Like, in fact, I think there were even some glitches before going... There were glitches before going, yeah, exactly. So this is where it gets really hard to disentangle. Do the robot stories come, uh, the personalities come about as a result of those stories? I mean, perhaps. To a certain extent, when you, when you listen to these stories, you do hear the story of the team persevering. You do hear the stories of the robot breaking and the team kind of figuring out how to work around that and the robot seeming to be a bit obstinate. But talking to the principal investigator about this, there was a moment at the robot funeral where he, um, he was talking about the robot's personalities. And he said, you know, when you, when you, when, if you were there when they were born, and they started to move and behave and take on personalities, and I was never able to let go of that. You know, even this far into the mission, I was never able to let go of that. So there's a sensibility in which the robots have a kind of personality from the start, and the way that the robots sort of handle things along the way reveals different aspects of that personality. So it's, um, it's a really tricky thing to try to work out. They certainly weren't encoded with personalities before they left. Does that answer that? Yeah. Okay. So... Um, so there's a series of things that people would do that I refer to as a kind of physical calculus. And this is a way in which they would use material objects around them in order to make sense of the digital visualizations they were getting and the digital signatures they were getting from the robot on Mars. So here's an example where there's a, uh, an operator using the camera she, for the camera for the rover. She's trying to figure out how to take a picture of something that's very close to the robot, or as she said, between our feet. Uh, so not her feet, but actually the robot's feet. Um, and that's a very complicated task because of where and how the camera is going to point. So what she did was print out pictures of what was around the robot and sort of laid them out on that computer screen as if it was kind of like the area around her, around the robot. And that was how she was able to make sense of where and how the robot should be pointing. So taking this out of a digital realm and into a physical realm before she's able to do that calculating work and put it into the software. Um, I have certainly witnessed people using wheelie chairs in order to sort of work their way through robot encounters. Um, in another really interesting case related to the panoramic cameras, uh, people would put post-it notes on their foreheads at the beginning of the mission, which sounds completely ridiculous, except that the PanCam operation software will show you a, a picture of the, the scene, and then you, you, you tell it where you want it to take a picture by putting a little yellow square over it, a yellow square much like a post-it note, right? So people would put these post-it notes on their forehead and kind of make this, uh, this relationship between what was happening on their bodies and what was happening on the screens and then what was happening on Mars. 
And certainly engineers would talk about how when they're training new rover drivers, you can tell that they get it when they can start using their own arms. When they're talking about a robotic move with the arm, they pick their arm up and move it just so. Or they start moving their bodies in a particular kind of way. Another engineer that I spoke to described how um, he was a long distance runner and he said, you know, uh, you know how when you go for a really long run, you know how you're gonna feel the next day? You know, you're maybe gonna feel a bit sore the next day? Well, I know that with the rover. If it's gone for a really long drive or something, I know what it's gonna feel like. I know what it's gonna be like tomorrow. Again, a sensibility in his body related to the kind of work the robot was doing. So some of this, um, didn't just happen on the level of material practices, but it also started to happen on a level of gesture and embodiment that I was able to observe across the mission. I'm going to show you a brief video clip, and I should note that this video was not captured in the wild. It was a <laughs> uh, it was a moment when I asked one of the instrument operators to please demonstrate some of the things that I'd seen people do around the lab repeatedly and using their bodies to be like the robot. And note in this in this example how she talks specifically through and then uses her body to show the ways in which she connects her own experience on Earth to the robots on Mars. Okay, so my body is always the rover. Here's the front of the rover, here's my magnets, and here's my solar panels. And I would see people in talks or, you know, in, certainly there was one moment in a talk where this one guy was like, remember, we were doing this thing with Opportunity, we were kind of over here, and then we sort of went over here a bit, and we did this one, and he got up and he was like, wait a minute, Janet, where's your camera? <laughs> so I'm totally doing it right now. Um, and they would literally move their bodies around in this particular way. Now, there's a way of thinking about this as if it was a gesture of communicative practice. It's one thing if we're one second. One thing if we're in the room together and we are like, okay, so we are, you know, interacting, and I'm going to be like, let's move the robot's arm this way, right? That would be one thing. But these are people sitting in a teleconference room, like by themselves, maybe with an ethnographer in there with them. But they're they're talking into a teleconference system. There's nobody there to see them move their arms. They are working that through in their own bodies as they're describing the different things that the robot might be doing on the surface. So yes. Uh, wouldn't this have this? Uh, wouldn't there be a major downside in that the robot's degree of movement and the kind of uh, you know the kind of movements the robot arms can make? Would be probably it might end up being very different from what yes. a human arm can make. So their calculations might sort of end up being like wrong, right? Right. Well, so they're not necessarily using it to specifically calculate out. Instead, it was kind of again the physical calculus notion is a way of thinking through how do people do the quick, sort of like the quick sums in their head, the kind of notion in their head of whether or not this is going to work on Mars or not. And so they would have this, they would rely on this very intuitive embodied sense of what the robot would do in order to do things. So actually the, the opposite side of that is that it actually enabled them to do some really amazing things on Mars. They it enabled them to push the robot in ways that no one had ever intended. So uh, no one intended the robot to use its own arm and use the Microsoft camera on, the, on its own arm to look underneath its solar panels and be able to detect whether or not it was stuck on a rock. I mean, no one had ever expected to do that. No one had ever expected to drive the robot up at the kinds of slopes that it did. No one ever, there were several things that they managed to push the robot to do or use its wheel to crush, um, to crush rocks on the surface and then take pictures of that. It was never designed for any of that. But it was part of that embodied sensibility of what the robot could do in their own bodies. They're like, oh, hey, couldn't we just kind of crush this a little bit? Interestingly, too, the, the way that you related to the robot's own bodies changed as the robot's bodies underwent some changes on Mars as well. So about 400 days in, um, 600 days in, Spirit's wheel stuck. It got stuck. And actually part of the reason why they managed to turf up that white soil was that the robot was stuck in this sand trap and it was kind of driving back and forth. And if you've ever tried to push a shopping cart with a stuck wheel on the front, you know that it's actually really hard to do that, right? So the engineers gradually figured out it was easier to drag that shopping cart, so they just started driving Spirit backwards. So for a while there, it was like, oh my god, our broken rover, it's terrible, it's broken, this is really horrible. And then they started realizing, once they realized that the, it was that stuck wheel that had turfed up that light soil, they stopped calling it the bum wheel and they started calling it the trenching tool, right? Because you could just drag the robot and you could create a trench as you did that and take pictures of that and do science with that. So in fact, the embodiment actually gave them more flexibility, not because they were doing actual calculations, but because they could, they could use their bodies to work through what the robot might be able to or might not be able to do. Um, but things do get a little stranger. I mean, I'll also point to some ways in which the robot's body becomes important in a couple of minutes. Um, but things do get a bit stranger in that st it's not just that we get an embodied sense of what the robot is doing in our own bodies, but we might also rely on stories about what the robot is doing to make sense of our experiences on Earth.
So here is a, a quote from a scientist in her 50s that I interviewed. She said, you know, it was really strange. I was working in my garden one day, and all of a sudden, I just my right wrist just stopped working out of nowhere. Like, I couldn't use it. I got to the rover meeting the next day, and Spirit's right front wheel was broken. That's why my right wrist stopped working, right? Because I am totally connected to that robot. So in case you're like, well, that's a bit weird, and maybe it's because she's you know, female or a scientist, uh, <laughs> here is a young 30-something male engineer. You know, it's funny, I screwed up my shoulder in Taekwondo, and I needed surgery on it right around the time when Opportunity shoulder joint stopped working, and I broke my toe right before Spirit's wheel broke. So I don't know, I'm just saying maybe there's probably not any magic involved, maybe it's something sympathetic, I'm not really sure. Um, and certainly working on the mission, you could tell, like as people were walking down the hallway from the sound of the, the, the PI always wears the cowboy boots, and you could hear the sound of his heels on the, on the floor outside, and you could tell if it was a good day on Mars or not. Um, certainly when there was a dust storm in 2007, and Opportunity was caught in this dust storm, people would hunch over at their desks. I mean, they made their bodies small. They talked about how it was like having a grandparent in a hospital, and you, and you knew that the doctors were doing everything they could, but you were just, all you could do was just sort of sit there and hope that they would make it through. So these kinds of like sympathetic relationships with the rover went from just trying to understand what it was the rover was doing to make drawing this direct connection to what it was the robot was doing on Earth. And that's why largely when people would talk about their work, they would say, I, when I'm doing this work, I am a rover. So how do we make sense of that? <laughs> As a sociologist in the laboratory, watching this happen, um, it's uh, on the one hand, it's quite amazing to see people use their bodies this way and to use these stories. But the other hand, you're trying to figure out, does this serve a purpose within the context of the team? Or is this just some kind of weird thing that people do when they're confronted with robots? So to, uh, to answer that question, I have to zoom out a little bit and tell you a little bit about how the Mars Rover team works as a team. Um, and here's a snapshot from the, uh, the in-house video feed, which was one of the main ways in which people knew how to communicate or were communicating with each other at the time. So what you need to know about the Mars rover mission team is that it is a, a led by a single principal investigator with a flattened hierarchy. So that is, there's a group of scientists and engineers who work together. It's up to about 150 people at any given time. Um, but they are all arranged much more laterally than vertically. So there's still a hierarchy. There's still a PI at the top. Um, but, they are, uh, but they all work together around this robot. The PI describes the robot as something like a Swiss army knife. It's a single tool, but it has multiple different capabilities. And you can bring any of those together to solve a problem on Mars. This is very different than how NASA normally flies missions. Normally they say, we're going to go to Jupiter, who wants in? And a whole bunch of people apply to have an instrument on there. And NASA selects which instruments go on the mission. And those instruments go on and they have a team of scientists that work with that instrument on Earth and they're not allowed to work with any other instrument, only with the instrument that's on that spacecraft. And they have to compete for the time and the resources in the spacecraft. Now it's important to know that spacecraft only have so much time. They only have so many bytes of onboard memory. They only have so many bytes that they can transmit in any given time to Earth. Um, they only have so much power in order to do the kinds of observations that people want to do. So it's a highly resource constrained space. It's sort of like being on a bus with 150 people where there's only one steering wheel and only one camera. And you can kind of only take like three pictures a day. And you can imagine that for the scientists and engineers on that bus or on that robot, they have a variety of different things that they would like to do. And they have to figure out how to decide exactly what the robot's going to do one thing at a time. So it becomes something of a micro-political problem behind the scenes. How are they going to make a decision? This is a team that has embraced the concept of consensus. Unilateral consensus is the way that they make decisions. And the, um, I don't have time to go into all of the processes here, but I'll mention that there's a variety of different forms of talk, resources, uh, and technologies that you use in order to support this orientation towards consensus. The main meeting happens uh, once a day for each robot. It is an hour long. And as in that meeting, scientists and re engineers review the data that came down from the robot the night before. And they try to figure out what it is the robot should do the next day. One of the chairs of this meeting explained to me that the whole goal of the meeting is so that people at the end of the meeting feel like they have a sense of ownership ownership over, this, over the plan. You want everyone to feel like they're part of the process. As he later explained, it's the whole empowerment thing. They need to feel like they're being listened to and like they're part of the process. So it's not, there's no voting, there's no I want to do this and I'm more important than you, but instead that the whole process of working together is one of making sure that we are constantly working together. You'll notice that even on the video conferencing screen, it might look like nobody showed up for work that day because all of these seats are empty, but actually what this does is it's a visual reminder that all of these people are phoned in on the teleconference line. And you need to be able to agree with all of them at the end of the meeting. And you only have an hour with which to do so. 
Now, interestingly, at the end of the hour, they go around the room virtually on the teleconference line. They ask everybody on the line, are you happy? And everybody has to say, yes, I'm happy before they proceed. And you should try this at your next faculty meeting. <laughs> Just try it, you know, because it's super easy. And actually, it's, um, I jest, but it's actually what the joke reveals the fact that you can't just go to the end of the meeting and be like, are you happy? You have to have worked the whole way through to make sure that by the time you get to the end of the meeting, people are happy. And you have to use a variety of different tools and resources in order to do that. So one of the resources that they use is actually the rover's body itself. Like the concept of this embodiment, embodied relationship with the robot becomes very important for achieving that kind of consensus behind the scenes. As one of the operators has said to me, look, to be fully prepared for my job, I need to literally be that vehicle. That's what all that visualization software I use is all about, right? Because for me, you have to intuitively make decisions. You have to get questions on the fly and you have to answer them on the fly. And so you're not you, you're the rover. I think of myself as the rover so I can call the shots. I need to know where I am as the rover. It's a huge, huge part of my job. So seen in that light, in the context of this meeting where you need to come to consensus, those kinds of physical activities and physical calculus and that embodied relationship with the rover doesn't seem so strange because it's actually part of your job, right, to be able to do that. Images also play a really important role in producing consensus as well. So here's a case where a false color image was being circulated among members of the team. And a scientist really wanted the rover to drive from over here, where the rover is sitting, taking the picture, to like over on that side of the, over on that side of the screen. And in order to do that, he needed to be able to show that the rover was going to be able to drive there effectively, that he'd evaluated these things as obstacles and the slopes and made sure that it was going to be okay. So first of all, he put it into false color, because in false color, the rocks kind of pop out at you. Um, so you can tell exactly where those obstacles are. Remember that whole thing about evaluating his obstacles? And then he draws this line here and says, this is a minimal ridge. Remember the slope map? This is minimal. We're going to be able to drive over it, and it's going to be OK. And then he puts that up, and he says, look, you showed one on-ramp to this area called home plate. This is a team that loves baseball. I'm happy to answer questions about that later on. But I had to learn a ton about baseball to understand what they were talking about. You showed this on-ramp to home plate that did look unapproachable or difficult. But what I'm wondering with these images is an alternative that I wondered if you'd looked at as well. So he puts this out there on the teleconference line. And an engineer, the rover driver, comes back and says, look, we've looked at all those southern approaches, and we just don't think they're viable. We don't want to get stuck somewhere that we can't recover. Now, one of the divides that might potentially happen on the team is between scientists and engineers. And the team is constantly working to integrate and to achieve consensus. So that division between scientists and engineers is one of the things that they constantly have to overcome and they're deeply attuned to. So this is really like a little mini crisis moment behind the scenes because the scientist wants to do something. He, seeing like a rover, thinks that it's going to be possible. And the engineer is like, I just don't think we're going to be able to do that. So what happens, this is a classic move in a consensus-based team. Another scientist speaks up and says, here's an alternative. If you can't agree between A and B, choose C. Maybe this one's going to be better instead. And he starts parsing it out, seeing like a rover, right? It looks very approachable. It's smooth looking. He's already starting to evaluate obstacles in the way, and eventually the team decides that's where they're going to go. So they have this kind of talk and these kind of images that are used behind the scenes in order to generate that sense of consensus. I'd like you to notice one other thing, and that is the use of the pronoun we. And here, we doesn't mean we, the engineers, or we, the scientists. It means we, the rover. And in fact, behind the scenes, the one pronoun that was used over and over and over again to describe the robot was we. So we are going to turn around and take images from this ridge. We are going to, we are four meters away from that outcrop we want to image. We're going to bump forward. We're going to take these images. We're going to do, et cetera. Not necessarily we, but we, the rover. And something of a royal we, right? It's like the rover and the team. The team is complicit in everything that the rover does. Um, so and images like these would also play a really significant role there, because what you can see is that you are sitting in the position of the rover, right? We're seeing like a rover. We're using one of these HASCAM avoidance images. And it's being drawn up to show you what kinds of things you're looking at, and therefore to help you come to consensus about what the robot should do next. So in this case, the body of the robot, the use of that we, becomes a resource in the politics of consensus. If everyone is occupying the same position at the same time, the body of the robot, it becomes easier at the end of the day to get to that happiness moment, right? Because we start from the same place so we can end at the same place. Um, now, to that extent, the, uh, the body of the robot is incredibly important for forging that relationship among members of the team that enables them to come to consensus. And to that end, it becomes very interesting to think about what happens when that body is no longer there. So uh, in 2007, two faulty commands were uploaded to Spirit. 
and uh, in a row, basically, within the same week, and the project basically ground to a halt. They were like, hey, stop, this is terrible. We've got to, we've got to reevaluate what we're doing. They sent everyone home for the weekend. They're like, go see your kids, go for a hike, go do something else. On Monday, we'll get back together and we're gonna talk about this because how is it that we as a team could have made these mistakes and put our robot in jeopardy? So they came back together on Monday morning and there was this huge, I mean, the, the room at JPL was absolutely full. The teleconference line was full. Everyone had phoned in from all over the country and even all over the world. And they had a conversation about what they thought they could be doing better, what they thought they could do differently. And one engineer said the following, I thought was interesting. I get the feeling that new team members don't have the fear that we had at the beginning of the mission. It's more of a video game for a lot of people. It's kind of cool. It's abstracted a little bit. They might not be as connected to the fact that the rover is only one day away from, we're never going to hear from it again. And anything we do could potentially ruin the whole game. So one of the things that he's doing is critiquing the way that new team members haven't exactly learned yet how to see like a rover. They haven't learned to not only be able to evaluate the terrain as obstacles, but also to bring that into their own body and have alongside that a sense of a relationship to the team. Instead, they're coming in having played, in this case, Doom, mostly, because <laughs> it was back in the day. They're playing those like first-person shooters, and they have this very particular view of computer vision, right, of, of the way that we would interact with a computational environment that's being presented to us in a visual way. And in that way, like if something happens, if you die, you know, you have a one up, you start again, you play it again. There's no one up. There's no, there's no start over. There's no do over. If you die, the whole team is disintegrating. It's not just that you lost the robot, you've lost everything. And that's the way you're supposed to work with these images, he argues. You're supposed to be able to see in these images, not only the robot moving around on Mars, but also have that, that sense of the weightiness of the whole team riding on your shoulders. To that extent, anthropologically, I would borrow from um, you know, old school work in anthropology and sociology about the role of the totem, the role of the totem object. And that is that the totem is an object to which a, a tribe or a group um, feels like they have a very strong connection, not only because that, rope, that totem is a representation of that group, but also because how that totem fares has some kind of relationship to how the group will fare. And this is a very old idea in anthropology, but what's interesting is to see it alive and well today on a 21st century spacecraft robotic team, where there is a, a sense that how the robot is faring is deeply connected to how the team is faring, and that working together as a team is one of the ways of sustaining that robot and vice versa. And this is really summed up in some of the ways that team members spoke about their robots as, as a totem, as like a way of having a connection to each other as well. The hardware is like the glue that bonds the team together while it's being built on Earth. And that time we can directly relate over something physical. But once the spacecraft is off the ground, that connection moves into the software realm and also into our minds. So I would argue the dynamics of the team took on greater meaning once spirit and opportunity left the planet, because once those rovers leave Earth, the team is all we've got. So those techniques of being able to see like a rover, being able to feel and move and gesture and, and be like a rover are all connected also to this success of the team. So I've argued that in order to operate robots on Mars, that scientists and engineers are bringing together in this very complicated way not only visualizations and visual manipulations, but also this gestural and embodied relationship to the robot's experience on Mars. And finally, they do that in a particular social context, one that is oriented towards a very unique and particular model of teamwork that brings people together around this robot, and that that's what we should really talk about when we talk about learning to see like a rover. And I'm going to close by bringing out three or four implications I think are important for human-computer interaction more generally. And the first is that, um, going back to this notion of the plurality of these images, that there's no one best way to show these images. They're not like, this is the best and the only way to show Mars. But instead, that you, when you see it in all these different ways, then you come to know it. And I think there's an important implication there for the way we think about data visualization, particularly in an era of big data, when there's the ability to trans transform images over and over and over again, to have different visual inroads into very large and complicated data sets. And that there, you know, I know the whole Tufty phenomenon is one of being able to produce something that's beautiful or that's inspiring as, a, as an image that will help you intuit your way through the data. But perhaps another way of thinking about this is to think about the plurality of representations that we can have of those data systems. And that by transforming it in a number of different ways to see different elements in the scene, that way we might get to know it. 
Um, another important element from this, uh, from this study is that bodies are an essential part of working with visualizations. It is not only that visualization happens with eyes and screens, but it happens with bodies, with hands, with I am a rover, et cetera. It happens with material elements that are being assembled around those screens in order to make sense of what's happening on the screen. Sometimes those are bodies and sometimes they're pieces of paper printed out. And if we lose the ability to pay attention to those material objects, we're going to lose a very uh, serious and important element um, that we could be designing around and with. Thirdly, that um, I think what's fascinating about this example is that we can have very rich interaction with robots that don't look anything like us at all. We can have very complicated stories about who they are and what their personalities are and how we might relate with them and have a very strong emotional attachment to these robots without them looking like the, us at all. And in fact, to a certain extent, what that relies upon is not its anthropomorphic qualities, but instead the organizational context. That one of the things I would argue and that I've started to see in, in my, my more recent studies with NASA is this is a very unique way of relating to this robot. And to a certain extent, it's not unique if you think about it from an organizational perspective. Perspective. A kind of flat hierarchy uh, with a very uh, integrated team and one that's focused on consensus. It's not surprising to see totemic social relations emerge from that sense. So to that extent, the kind of relationships that we have with this robot are predicated upon that organizational context. But what that means is that in order to think about the ways in which our technologies are going to be used, we need to think not just beyond the desktop, but beyond the single user and the single technology, to think more about the organizational context in which these technologies are embedded. Now, that could be if you're designing something for a hospital, right? If your robot knows how to take a like, blood pressure and how to give a painless shot or something like that, but it doesn't know that it should pay more attention to what the doctor says than what the nurse says, that robot is going to be dead in the water, right? So there's lots of a variety of different ways of bringing in the organizational context of the work that we do. But what that's going to mean is using these particular kinds of ethnographic and interview techniques to move away from those desktop, to move away from those one-to-one -one human computer interactions to think about that much more in the context of the organization. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I welcome any questions. Thanks. Fred. Yes. Thank you, Jenna. That was a really compelling talk. Thanks. Um, no, thank you. It was great. Um, as, as you were talking, I was struck by the ways in which you, uh, the importance you assign to bodies, both the bodies of the human beings and the bodies yeah. of the Mars rover itself. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's learning to train your body to behave in your own imagination like the body on the other planet yeah. that lets you become a part of the team. Yeah. And I was struck, you know, deep, you know, Durkheim all over the place. Yeah, Durkheim, yes. Durkheim all over the place, great. <laughs> so I was trying to think of a counter case. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about open source software. Yep. I was thinking about the ways in which people feel effervescence even in the absence of a machine to orient their bodies in that direction. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm kind of wondering about is is how important are bodies in the production of effervescence in technological settings? Can you do it without a machine at the center that you have to see like? Can you imagine yourself, can you embody the spirit of open source community or some other thing mm -hmm. that makes it feel effervescent even when the machine's not there and you're not in the room with the team? Yeah, it's a really good point. I, would, and I have to think about that because I haven't studied open source communities, although I know a lot of people who work in them. Um, I would say that even if the body doesn't necessarily matter, other kinds of materialities and material cultures do matter. So it may be that the platforms that they're working with or working through play some kind of a role. I'm thinking about Karen Norsetina and Urs Brueger's work on the market as an object of attachment. Like people who work as, as financial traders are uh, producing the market even as they're seeing it and they are constantly in this, this, this kind of entrainment with their, with their screens. Um, and they talk about the market as kind of being everywhere and all around them, even though they're sort of co-producing it at the same time. So I would still expect to see like those kinds of social effects and certainly belonging to a community of open source people who are who span across the world can be in a, a tremendously uh um, invigorating an emotional kind of experience, certainly knowing many of my, like my brother is a Drupal programmer, right? And his, my gosh, you can't say a bad thing about Drupal at all in front of him ever, right? Because then that's like taking down the whole team. I would also say that there are other kinds of totemic or symbolic relations, you know, the, the Linux penguin, et cetera. I mean, there's, there's symbols that we might use in order to delineate ourselves as members of a community or not. But I would still look for those kinds of material instantiations. And then I would look at other elements of embodiment, particularly with respect to code. In what ways are are we attenuated to, um, if it's a market, the kind of market system? In what ways are we expected to use our body?
bodies in order to code? In what ways are we expected to be, you know, up until five in the morning drinking Red Bull, et cetera? Like that's pretty much, that's an embodied experience as well. It might not be one of like this, right? But it's certainly a very particular kind of body that's expected to do that and a particular kind of training that's expected to do that. So when they meet each other, when, it, when open source engineers meet each other, like, you know, not only was I working until one in the morning in my real job, but then I was, you know, fixing this bug until six. And, it, and they have these kind of war stories about that. I mean, I think that's a really important part of membership in the community, just as much as knowing that this is how the robot moves, not like this, you know, is also part of membership. A great, great question. Yeah, James. So when you do uh, field work uh, or especially things like ethnography, yeah. one issue is getting access to the field side. Yes. Participants, and I'm curious, you know, did the, did the teams uh, perceive any benefit for them of you doing this work? And also, was the fact that Steve Squires is a Cornell professor at all help you get into this, or is that just a Sure. I mean, one of the main ways I was able to get in was actually because I was affiliated with Cornell. Um, and uh, this was important because spacecraft are subject to international regulations about um, trafficking in armaments, because spacecraft are uh, technically um, weaponry in some classified sense. Um, knowing things about spacecraft systems is uh, classified or is restricted only to American nationals. And it's only within a university context that actually you, you can't discriminate based on national orientation or national on any kind of orientation, but certainly not on, on, on nationality. Um, so there was a certain way in which being at a university was almost the only way that I could start working on this on this mission. And also because it was more focused on the science and not necessarily the engineering. And in the book I talk a lot about this, that because of that uh, issue about um, national restrictions, the engineering was very much off limits for me in, in this kind of observation. I could really only work with the scientists. Um, I could talk to the engineers, and I certainly did, but I couldn't sort of sit in the meetings while they're actually coding what goes up to the robots. That was off limits. So um, being at the university was important. Being at Cornell was also important. Um, but I will say, like, access is not a single like, one-time thing. It's an evolving thing, and it's an evolving conversation. And at this point, I've been involved with planetary science for 10 years. And basically, I started 10 years ago. And um, my interactions with them have been predicated on very different kinds of reciprocity over time. So while I worked on the rover team, I also worked as an image calibrator, which was great because on the one hand, I was interested in images and how you produce images and how you produce trustworthy images. And so to be somebody who's like in the pipeline making that happen was part of the study. But it was also you know some of the implications I came up with were things that the, the guy who ran the cameras then ended up implementing as part of a way to improve his team. I think also it's worth noting that there's a group in HCI at NASA at Ames, and they had done some studies of the mission in the early days, especially when they lived on Mars time, and everyone had these like Mars watches that were 24 and a half hour days, and, and apparently it was crazy. Um, so they had some sensibility to what HCI looked like, what CSCW looked like, what this kind of research looked like. But that conversation about how you might uh, contribute to the missions changes a lot over time, and it kind of, uh, it's not a T1, it's a T, TN plus one kind of conversation. Yes. I have a question about belonging and this. Mm -hmm. You talked about this in some sense in response to Fred's question, also that quote about newcomers seeing it like a computer game. Yeah. And I can imagine that people who, who join this mission a little later, uh, they might not feel like they belong in this group of people who are very much associated with the robot, who are the robot in a way. Yeah. Um, and if there were any rituals that help people belong more, because we know so much about how belonging uncertainty can lead to negative outcomes. Yes. Yeah. Well, one of the rituals I think that very much helped with belonging at the beginning was being in a, uh, was at the very outset was living on Mars time. So as much as everyone talks about how much they hated that period, they were basically permanently jet lagged for three months, right? So it was not the most fun. And when you think about ever, <laughs> when you think about those like, you know, consultants that come in and want to do like, you know, trust training in your organization and they, they get people to like stand up and like fall over and everyone holds on. They basically did that for like three months when they lived on Mars time. Like, cause you're constantly falling over and hoping that your colleagues are going to be there to help you sometimes like physically and literally. So that was a really strong, I don't want to say bonding experience cause it sounds, it sounds much weaker, but it was an incredibly strong uh, experience for members of the team, a kind of a set of ritual interactions that really brought them together. Two years in, they brought in a new set of team members. Uh, they had a new open competition and they brought in these new team members. By the time I showed up on the mission, you really couldn't tell the difference between the new team members and the old ones. Some of them had seen the robots, like, quote unquote, in the flesh before they had left. Um, 
and they, they, uh, but the the way that they had learned to move and see like a rover or use their bodies like a rover were were transferred to or transmitted to new members of the team. So I almost couldn't tell the difference when I first came in if there was a distinction between the newcomers and the people that had been there for a long time. And I found it took about a good six months before I also started to feel like a rover in my own body. Before I started to know what it felt like to be spirit versus opportunity, because they feel somewhat different. You know, spirit has a the wheel, and opportunity has this weird sort of shoulder joint, and you could kind of get a sense in your own body of what that felt like to be the robot. So it took a good about six months before that really came on as part of the embodied practice. But if there were any specific rituals that were involved, I think actually learning to move your body like the robot was a very powerful way of belonging to the team. And I also realized that later on I had an article that was published in an HCI journal um, and they wanted to illustrate it. And they were like, this is great. They, they came up, they had this illustrator and they drew pictures of people moving their bodies like robots and they sent it to me and I was like, this is terrible. It looks nothing like the rover dance. Like this is not at all what they do. <laughs> you know, because they had people doing crazy other things. And they were like, oh, but it's just an artist's impression and so on. And it really revealed to me how much there were very specific ways of moving like that robot that you were supposed to acquire that really marked you as a member. Good question. Lots of. Okay. Hi. Go ahead. Uh, did they have any prop of the robot or like you know fake robot same size or something that could represent mm -hmm. the movements? And so, if so, how did that map with what they were doing? Mm -hmm. And if they didn't have, would that have changed their interaction? It's a really good question. They did have some props. Almost everyone had some like, you know, Lego robot or maybe not Lego, but other like sort of micro machine or some kind of model robot that was sort of available. But they kind of sat in the corner. They weren't really used. Um, most people didn't really pay attention to them. They were kind of, you know, they would get decorated like that robot that had that pin saying that it was two years old um, because that was uh, Spirit's second year uh, birthday on Mars. Um, so they, they did have those kind of instantiations, but they weren't used or referred to as a way of trying to understand how the robot was going to work. The one exception is there is a third rover, and it is on Earth, and it is at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and it has its own little sandbox, and you basically use it if you're trying to work something out that's kind of complicated and weird. Um, and I remember finally uh, getting to a chance to see that robot in person, and it was a very weird experience. It was a, almost like a disembodying experience. It's like meeting yourself, right? Like for, It was a very weird, weird thing, because I'd been so used to seeing things from that rover's position, um, along with all these other members of the team, that to see a robot in the flesh was a very strange thing. Now that said, um, the robot was usually imitating the things that the robots were doing on Mars or were sort of working through what the robot might do on Mars. And I do remember being at a meeting, um, or, or being at a, 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 went into that room at one point and someone was, uh, she was, she was talking about the work they were doing with the robot. It was when Spirit was, was almost, almost dead. Spirit was dying. And they were trying to figure out how to get Spirit out of this sand trap that it was stuck in. It had been stuck also on top of a rock. So it was basically almost impossible. And they had this robot and then the sand pit and the robot's kind of listing to one side like this, you know, because it's kind of set up like Spirit on Mars. And here's this woman talking to me and I noticed she had a brace on her leg. And I'm like, gosh, what happened to your leg? She's like, oh, I had this freak salsa dancing accident. Like, I don't know, it was kind of weird. I'm like, really, when did that happen? She's like, you know, it was around the time when Spirit got stuck, right? So, so to a certain extent, seeing that robot on Earth like this, and then she's kind of standing like this, was another kind of physical representation of that relationship. But they don't tend to use them that much. Now, then I moved to another mission, to a different side of the solar system, one that's more bureaucratic, one that's more hierarchical, and much like a completely different social organization. And they have models of their spacecraft all over the place, and they use them to physically you know, move through how the spacecraft is going to work. And that's part of the coordination work between these different between these different sub-teams on that, on that spacecraft team. But um, I didn't see anybody have the same kind of emotional energy or anxiety around their robots in the same way that happened on this team. Yes? Um, so you talked a bit about how the emergence of this embodiment was kind of predicated on the fact that the robot, that it wasn't automated, right? You, you mm -hmm. had very specific, very difficult things you had to do. You could only take pictures. It took a while to send data. So you really had to like think like a robot, see yeah. the little kind of snapshots that the robot got. Um, and if you had asked me before, you know, this talk, if would it have been better if the robot had been fully automated, I would have said, hell yeah. I mean, if the robot could just walk around and do whatever, and we didn't have to step through all these obstacles. But you also mentioned mm -hmm. that there were advantages once you had embodiment, that there was, like, things that, that you thought of that you couldn't have thought of otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, you know, in general, as we as we automate technology and we think, oh, this will make it easier, this, this will make it better, in your experience, what kind of things do we lose 
when we sacrifice the embodiment of manually using this tool as if it were, you know, an extension of ourselves? Yeah, it's such a good question because I think actually a lot of the expertise is in that embodiment and it is in what we would call sociologically tacit knowledge, the stuff that's not able to be communicated specifically or explicitly, but is actually part of the work of getting, of, um, of knowing in your body how to do one thing or another. So in those classic examples, brushing your teeth or riding a bike, but I would argue it also applies to the robot. I think what's interesting about these robots and their limited capabilities is that they, to a certain extent, they're limited. They don't think like humans. They don't move like humans. But that's also their advantage. Remember the scientists saying, like, I don't want to see Mars that's red. I want to see Mars in all of these these wavelengths that I can't see. You know, so for many of them, you know, it's, it, does it kind of suck that the robot can only do so much at a time and it can't drive very far? Like, yeah. And if they were out there on Mars, they would be doing differently. But many of them also talked about the fact that the, the robot was their advantage, right? Because it was so different than humans. It could see things that humans couldn't do. It could do things that humans couldn't do. I mean, one thing, go to Mars. Um, and that was the advantage. One of the things I think we lose when we think too heavily about anthropomorphizing robots is it, and, and this is a, you know, obviously there's long-standing critiques of artificial intelligence this way, but it's thinking about the things that we, that, that robots or computers or uh, agents or bots could do that are like what humans can do. And it's way more interesting to see them do things that aren't what humans can do. Because the ways that humans then make sense of that and interact with that and kind of create this sort of symbiotic team is, is goes way beyond what a human could do or even an intelligently augmented human could do. So I, I mean, I, I think not only do we lose something if we lose that if we move away from that embodied relationship by totally automating things, I think the risk of automating is the risk of losing what's actually important about what these robots do and what's important about how they interact with humans. So the, the automation impulse is clearly like alive and well in many different ways, um, but I think often we automate the wrong things or we, for, by not paying attention to these elements such as gesture and emotion and so on, like that kind of teamwork, if we just automated the robot without the team, um, how would you do any science? How would you do the collaborating? So I, I think that's where thinking more carefully about automation is going to be and about how we can create agents that do very different things in humans and put them in really complex situations with humans is going to be way more interesting and way more exciting. Thanks. Yes. So you mentioned that these robots were relatively simple, a few degrees of freedom to sort of only do specific <laughs> right. stuff. I'm wondering, when does, or if so, when does the embodiment break down. You know, if mm. presumably if the system gets sufficiently complex, I can't do this anymore in any way that I can really attribute my own perceptive you know, right. grounding to. Mm -hmm. So did you have you seen it get to that point? And do you have to go to external aids like you saw with the new mission? Or or is it just we're operating in some new space that requires other kinds of, mm. of cognition? I don't know. I think uh, I'm trying to think of a good ex one good example, which I ha I haven't got to study. Curiosity, but Curiosity's arm works very differently, and it's huge, and it's beefy, and it's massive. And so there's kind of a question of how do you how do you create a sort of embodied relationship with the with that robot? What would that look like, given that it's it feels like it's on such a different scale from the human one? Um, I think the places where that's interesting to look at is when the robot breaks down, right? The fact that Spirit's wheel did break and Opportunity's shoulder did break. And what happened was not that, you know, in some cases people's arms broke. Um, but what happened was not that they were then unable to be that robot, but that they would sort of incorporate that brokenness into the way that they were the robot. So that is, I don't know if that answers quite your question, though. It's sort of going the opposite direction. Like, okay. You know, if it had eight arms, each of which had, like, lots of different, mm. like, uh, degrees of freedom to it. Like, at some point, it becomes difficult to, you can try to project what it might be like to, to see like a robot or to think like the mm -hmm. robot, but it's, but it becomes increasingly difficult. It's like, you, you talked about like drawing with Doom or like Mario or something right, like this. Right. It's a very yeah. simple set of rules that's easy to, it's easy to, to rock. But like, at some point you hit this uncanny valley where like, you know, if you get more and more realistic, well, you know, now it feels, it just becomes much more difficult to relate to. It doesn't feel mm. human anymore. I'm wondering if that happens again here. My guess about that, and I don't, I haven't seen this empirically, so I'm not sure this is actually an open question and someone in this room should do it. But my guess would be that actually the gestural and the embodied will become even more important the more distant the robot is from the way the humans are or interact. Because it's a way of sort of bridging that gap between the, between your body and what the robot is doing. So ironically, the more strange the robot is, I think the more important the materiality will be. Now that may be like if the robot has you know eight arms and a million degrees of freedom that we're not ever gonna be able to do that in our own bodies, but what we do do, maybe we do this. Like what gestures do people do in order to be that robot and how is that embedded in them? 
in the organizational context of working with that robot. Um, what physical objects, the physical calculus is a great example, right? Like that's printing things out. I mean, people talked about having um, uh, sheets of, uh, like collections of sheets of paper or books that were a certain weight because it would help them get a sense in their body of what the, what the pressure was that the rock abrasion tool was applying. You know, so they, they had a variety of physical helps and I would look at those physical material objects in order to see what those relationships are. And again, to get back to this question about automation, of course, you could go into there and be like, well, this is going to be you know, the paperless office, or you're just going to be able to intuitively understand this robot. You're not going to need any sort of physical helps at all. And if you sort of design that out of your space, you might have designed out the primary way that people are going to connect with that robot and with each other. So I hope that answers that. Great. There's one more question. Sure. So you mentioned early on that they did not defish eye the images that they were sending, that the robot was mm -hmm. sending. And I'm just curious to hear more about the reasons behind that. I mean, was that an intentional empathy kind of decision, or was it it's just I don't the think way it was they intentional? I mean, it's just, I mean, they got a lot of those. They have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of those images. So. Um, to a certain extent, it's kind of like a scale problem, but then you could always just run it through an algorithm as soon as it hits the ground. They would do other kinds of transformations with them, though, because you know if one of the things that you needed to figure out was the the topography of the terrain. So you would often use multiple different images to create a mesh of what the terrain looked like, and then you would not only use that for the for the topography, but then also overlay that on top. So you kind of have this very weird uh, stretched image, like moving, undulating over terrain, that you use those same images to figure out what that terrain was. Does that make sense? So I would see them get transformed in those ways. They would get used to compute a topography and then get used to sort of lay over the topography. But I very, very rarely saw them corrected to a rectangular frame. And I think, I, I think some of that actually ended up being related to these membership practices uh, in a way that wasn't necessarily intended from the beginning because they're engineering cameras. Like, why would you bother looking at the engineering cameras? But it turned out it ended up being a, a relatively important way of circulating among the team of interacting with, uh, with the pictures the robot took from Mars. So, unintended consequences. Hmm. All right. Great. Let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you.